that we have a reasonable appreciation for genetics, let's look at what is really driving all of this. What's really driving all of this, folks, are the macromolecules called proteins. So how do we go about making the unique little proteins that will bring about a given characteristic or maybe cause a given characteristic not to show up? Remember, everything is driven by way of proteins. Now, the genetic code is universal. It's universal, but the number of genes in a given species, of course, will depend on the complexity of a given organism. Now, looking at uh, some of this, looking at this illustration, we can see that a rather uncomplex organism like the yeast has about 6,000 genes, whereas the human, to the bottom, has about 30,000 genes. Now, the number of genes determines the number of different kinds of proteins that will be pr produced by a given organism. So, therefore, the human will produce approximately 30,000 genes. Now, this does not mean that every cell is producing 30,000 proteins. It just means that the potential is there for the production of 30,000 proteins. Every cell, however, will produce only the proteins necessary to maintain the viability of that particular cell. Proteins, of course, are made up of chains of amino acids. We have 20 different kinds of amino acids, and these amino acids are glued together essentially by way of peptide bonds to form the chain that we're looking at here with a amino group on the left and a carboxyl group on the right. A protein, of course, can either serve as a functional protein, for example, to form various tissues and, and substructure, or a protein can serve in a function such as an enzyme or an antibodies. For protein to function, it has to attain a tertiary structure, a three-dimensional structure, and it does so by folding and combining with itself to come up with a unique tertiary structure that can now participate in whatever that protein is designated to function in, in whatever purpose that protein has to serve. So making proteins, of course, is under genetic control. If you remember our basic central dogma, DNA goes to RNA and RNA goes to protein. Now, the process of going from DNA to RNA is called transcription. And the process going from RNA to protein is called translation. In translation, a message is produced which carries the blueprint for the assembly of proteins in this section is look carefully at transcription and translation. But before we can proceed, we need to understand a little bit more about DNA and RNA. First of all, to your left, we see that DNA and to your right, RNA are made up of nucleotides. Nucleotide is made up of a phosphate group, a sugar, and a base. The RNA to your left is identical to the DNA nucleotide to the right, except that you see that uracil is present in RNA rather than thiamine, and that the sugar ribose is deoxyribose in DNA. In addition, you see that RNA is single-stranded and DNA is double-stranded. Again, RNA will have the following nucleotides cytosine, guanine, adenine, and uracil, whereas DNA will have cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thiamine. Now, the genetic code works in this fashion. Basically, we say the genetic code is in triplicates. By triplicates, we mean that three nucleotides carry the information for a given amino acid. Let's look at this illustration. 
the DNA molecule on top has the sequence GCAAGTACCTGA. During the process of transcription, this information is copied over into the messenger RNA. A G will always form a C, a C will always form a G, and A will form a U because a U is what is present in RNA. So let's look at the transcription from DNA to RNA. The result is the formation of messenger RNA, and if you look at it in terms of triplicates, we have codons. C G, U is one codon, U, C, A is another codon, and so on. Each codon, when it reaches the cytoplasm, will control the production, or let's say will indicate which amino acid has to be put in place. C, G, U refers to arginine, U, C, A to serine, and so on. The end result is a string of amino acids that is formed, that is dictated by the codons that we see. So how do we know what the genetic code is? Fortunately, scientists have figured all of this out. Here's a table of codons that translate to amino acids. As you can see, to your left, you see the first base on top, second base to the right, the third base, and when we look at all of these, we can see the top left all the way, U, U, U represents phenylalanine. On the bottom, G, U, U represents valine, and so on and so on. Notice something else, that these codons also have a start codon to your left, A, U, G, indicates methionine, and that is the start codon. We also have several stop codons, UAA to your right and UAG right below that. So it is relatively easy to translate the genetic code because it is right there. All you have to do is look at the codons and look at the corresponding amino acid that it codes for. So let's review the process. DNA goes to RNA, RNA goes to protein. DNA to RNA is transcription, RNA to protein is translation. As you look at a cell, we can quickly see what happens when a gene is turned on and messenger RNA is produced through the process of transcription. The messenger RNA leaves the nucleus, goes outside, and finds a ribosome to hook onto. The ribosome carries the messenger RNA to the appropriate site for protein synthesis, and you can see the ribosome is able to read the codons, and these codons are translated to the string of amino acids put together to form the protein that you're trying to form. So now let's look at this in more detail. Yes, we need to be precise and understand this process because this is the essence of a big chunk of life. Transcription, key players, DNA, nucleotides, RNA nucleotides, and the enzyme called RNA polymerase. So in transcription, we're going to be forming a messenger RNA, and the enzyme that's going to partake in this process is referred to as RNA polymerase. So in transcription, you can see the DNA has opened itself up. It is exposing a segment that will code for a given protein. This segment basically is a single gene. It's opening up, and as you can see, the messenger RNA is being formed by different nucleotides coming together and matching up with the code that's present on the DNA. So wherever there's a G, a C comes in. Wherever there's a C, a G comes in. Wherever there's an A, a U comes in. And wherever there's a T, an A comes in. And so on and so on. You can see how we are building the string of messenger RNA. Now, once the message is made, it is clipped off. The DNA 
folds back into its tightly coiled helical structure, and the RNA, of course, will leave the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, this is where translation takes place. What are the key players? We've already said we need our messenger RNA. This has the message. We need our little factories to make protein, ribosomes. And then we need something else that we have not discussed, transfer RNA. These are little gophers to run around and bring a specific amino acid to the factory. Remember, there are 20 different kinds of amino acids. Therefore, there are probably at least 20 different kinds of transfer RNAs going out there and specifically grabbing them and bringing them to the factory for assembly under the direction of the messenger RNA. So briefly, let's look at the key players. A messenger RNA is a string of nucleotides. These are our codons. Our transfer RNA looks quite differently. It's a rather unique structure, and we will look at the structure in, in more detail. It is present in the cytoplasm. We also have the ribosomes, which will be our protein factories. Okay, so we have our key players here, and of course, the only thing we're missing, of course, are, is amino acids. The transfer RNA, as I refer to them as little gophers, if you look at it carefully, the transfer RNA are specific to go and grab a given factory. Remember, there are 20 different kinds of amino acids. A given transfer RNA will have a binding site on the top that will grab the amino acid, in this case, arginine. And on the bottom, it will have a recognition site that, that can recognize the codon on the messenger RNA. So you see, you've got this anticodon, GCU, that recognizes CGA, okay? Remember, C will always combine with G, and U will always combine with A. So in this case, the anticodon sees the codon, and it will attach itself, bringing the amino acid arginine to the party. So let's see if we can put all of this together in one easy summary look. To start with, we have the messenger, messenger RNA, attaching itself to the ribosome, exposing the codons. The first codon that's going to be exposed is AUG. If you looked at your original chart, AUG represents the start codon. The start codon will recognize UAC and the amino acid methionine comes in and it starts the process. Okay, the next level, we can see that we have another ribosome that's coming to play here. And that's just making the complete ribosomes, the factory, intact. We see now another amino acid being brought in by another transfer RNA. This amino acid, as you can see, is leucine, and the leucine will recognize the appropriate codon to attach itself to. Now you have two amino acids sitting together, being held together by transfer RNA. Now these things are moving left and right along the side, along the messenger RNA, and it's key, and it moves from left to right. As it's moving, another amino acid is brought to the party. Now, as these amino acids are being brought together, what's happening is that the amino acids essentially are glued together through the reactions that we discussed earlier called dehydration reactions. Therefore, one amino acid gets glued to another amino acid, gets glued to another amino acid, and really what we're doing now is specifically putting together a series of amino acids to form a polypeptide chain, which is a protein. So, looking at this translation, we can see the overall process results in a string of amino acids in the right sequence that are dictated by the codons on the messenger RNA. This slide illustrates what is really happening during translation. As you can see, the messenger RNA in yellow 
is weaving through and it is being read by not one ribosome, but by many ribosomes. So to your right, as one ribosome is reading the information and making a string of amino acid chain, another ribosome is right behind it and so on and so on and so on. Therefore, the process works in polysomes which means that there are many ribosomes all working together at a given time. And the bottom line is that this gives it more efficiency in the making of proteins. If you look, you can really see this under an electron micrograph. As you can see, we are looking at a string of RNA with the little dark spots being ribosomes. And you can see how the little chains of proteins are being formed. It's amazing how you can actually visualize the process of protein production.